Okay, I think we're going to uh, start exactly on time, uh, contrary to cultural conventions. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Shazad Bashir, and I'm the director of the, the program in Middle East Studies. Um, thank you very much for um, coming to this talk. Um, I will say a little bit about the, the context of this talk, and then introduce our um, speaker. So this is the first in a series of talks that is called Iran Today. And the idea is actually very simple, just to have um, a number of presentations on contemporary research on Iran, um, partly because Iran, as it is represented um, in the American political context, but also in many other places, is almost treated as a kind of political caricature. But underlying that, there is, of course, a very complex society with, uh, you know, an extensive and long history and all kinds of other, other activities that are going on. And there are um, research professionals who are actually working on these aspects. So what we are trying to do is to um, bring some people who are actually doing uh, research on Iran, in Iran, on the ground, and then um, to start a discussion to kind of densify our notion of what Iran uh, might be <clears throat> or is, uh, and find out what, where it might be going, and, and so on and so forth. So today is the first lecture with our uh, colleague um, Ali Reza Dustar. And later in November, we have a second person coming who will talk about um, contemporary playwrights in Tehran. Um, but you will get the details of that once um, everything is settled. Um, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ali Reza Dustar, uh, who is a professor of Islamic Studies and the Anthropology of Religion at the University of Chicago. He got his PhD at Harvard in 2009 and has been at the University of Chicago since 2012. Um, he has um, authored many um, interesting and important works. Most recently, this wonderful book called The Iranian Metaphysicals that recently came out. Um, one of the things that I can say about Professor Dustar's work is that it is um, conceptually and intellectually compelling, but also it belongs in the best uh, tradition of ethnographic writing that is lyrically beautiful. Uh, so it's always a pleasure um, to read his work, um, and, and I hope that this will come across um, as we hear the talk today as well. And last but not least, um, at least of the last I spoke to him, he's also a hidden international celebrity. Uh, and, and the reason is that if you ever travel or, on Iran Air, the English announcements are actually in his voice. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether this is continuing on or not. So Ali Reza, please welcome. Thank you, Shazad, for that wonderful uh, uh, introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. It's a delight to be here. It's my first visit to uh, Brown, my first visit to Providence, actually. And um, special thanks to Soraya McPherson for um, uh, making everything extremely smooth and uh, easy. Um, as for my voice on Iran Air, uh, it depends on whether you can hear it over the engines. It's uh, um, Sanctions haven't been done uh, 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 kindness to the Iranian uh, air fleet. So um, I'm going to um, speak about a topic that is uh, directly related to um, my book, which recently came out, but it's, um, uh, it's also uh, slightly at a tangent um, in relation to it. So I, um, uh, many of the themes that I'll be speaking about, for further context, you can, if you want, look at the book, but the uh, the arguments that I'm making and the, um, much of the content is actually not in the book itself. Iranian enthusiasts of the occult often draw on Hollywood fantasy and horror cinema when they try to make sense of things they deem to be metaphysical. I grew accustomed to hearing such filmic references during research in Tehran on occultism and alternative spirituality. In one of my earliest interviews in 2006, a private Arabic instructor and amateur treasure hunter recommended that I watch Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings to get a sense of the appearances of different tribes of jinn, presumably those creatures that Tolkien named orcs, ring wraiths, balrogs, elves, dwarves, and so on. Around the same time, a mechanical engineer and entrepreneur told me that Mr. Tumnus, the fawn in Andrew Adamson's The Chronicles of Narnia, was uncannily similar to Islamic representations of jinn. A few years later, a minor television actor and occult practitioner described some of her dream visions to me, 
and compared them to scenes from the Wachowskis, The Matrix. Meanwhile, a young psychology student and therapist who self-identified as a sorcerer told me half-jokingly of her affinities with Harry Potter. Finally, when I enrolled for seminars in the popular therapeutic mystical movement known as Cosmic Mysticism, Irfanik Kehani, I learned that the group liked to compare their healing practices to exorcisms depicted in William Friedkin's The Exorcist and Francis Lawrence's Constantine. Participants shared copies of these films among themselves, and the seminar's master quipped that I resembled Constantine's titular char character played by Keanu Reeves. I had more hair and was more black. Um, as I will show in my presentation today, these exuberant, if peculiar, appropriations of Hollywood cinema can hardly be dismissed as eccentric flights of fancy among a subcultural fringe. I suggest instead that we attend to them as expressions of broader attitudes toward transnational cinematic circulations. That is, such redeployments of Hollywood products, channeling sounds and images manufactured for entertainment in the service of cosmological, ethical, and therapeutic speculation, grant us a privileged window through which to examine the logics of cultural circulation between Iran and the United States. The empirical materials I will be examining are diverse, but they can be brought together under the sign of what I am playfully calling Hollywood cosmopolitanism. What I want to capture with this label is the diverse range of ways in which people open themselves up to cultural and religious others through the mediation of Hollywood movies. I begin by considering the rise of global spiritual cinema in Iran as a mode of cross-cultural experimentation with existential, religious, and mystical themes in film. I then turn to right-wing criticisms of spiritual cinema that attack Hollywood movies as vehicles for propagating Satanism even as their assaults draw inspiration from arguments provided by American white supremacists and evangelical Christians. Finally, I return to the examples with which I began to probe the complex ways in which Hollywood cinema resonates with some Iranians as they seek to understand the forces that shape their world. In 2005, officials at the Farabi Cinema Foundation an official arm of the Iranian Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, inaugurated a period of experimentation with what they called ma'nagara, or spiritual cinema. Part Islamic philosophical speculation, part film theory, and part criticism, discussions of spiritual films revolved around the problem of representing ma'na as expressed in two senses of the term. First, ma'na was understood as meaning, indexing a concern with philosophical, mystical, symbolic, and moral motifs that made a film into something more than escapist entertainment. Second, ma'na was used to refer to spirit as the opposite of matter, or madde, hence evoking the potential of films to gesture toward an immaterial domain beyond mundane existence. From the start, these conversations were mired in controversy. The proponents of spiritual cinema struggled to articulate why a new filmic category was useful and what conceptual and critical work it performed that could not be achieved using other appellations like religious, transcendent, mystical, or illuminationist, all of which had been deployed at one point or another to describe or valorize certain kinds of films. Circulating alongside these conversations were actual films. They were screened at the annual Fajr International Film Festival in Tehran, critiqued at monthly spiritual cinema events at the upscale Cinema Farhang on Shariati Avenue, broadcast to a mass audience on national television's Channel 4 as part of a series dubbed Cinema and Metaphysics, exchanged on VCDs and DVDs, and downloaded off the internet. Iranian films were central to discussions over spiritual cinema from the outset. They both enabled the development of Ma'anogera discourse and acted as audiovisual artifacts linking the new debates to older ones, over the place of Islamic piety, revolutionary commitment, and mysticism in film. This local frame notwithstanding, spiritual cinema was conceived as fundamentally global. In each of its annual events from 2005 to 2009, for example, the Fajr Festival screened over a dozen spiritual films, of which only a few were produced in Iran. Submissions also came from the United States, Canada, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Russia, the UK, China, Hong Kong, Japan, and South Korea. Channel 4's Cinema and Metaphysics had a similarly ecumenical vision. The series was famously inaugurated in 2005 by Francis Lawrence's Constantine, and its roster included David Fincher's Seven, Wim Wenders' Der Himmel uh, über Berlin, 
Ismail Farouki's The Grand Voyage, Andrei Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice, M. Night Shyamalan's The Village, The Wachowski's The Matrix, and even Rhonda Byrne's The Secret, an Oprah uh, favorite. Hollywood productions played an outsized role in this cinematic imaginary, followed by movies that owed their fame to the global circuits of prestigious festivals, especially those of Cannes, Berlin, Toronto, and Venice. Refracted through the lens of Matinon, these foreign films were recruited to a rich and varied inquiry that was at once cosmopolitan and distinctly Iranian. European existentialist films and Hollywood fantasy, sci-fi, and horror will thus become commensurable with the mystical, at times messianic cinema of Iranian auteurs like Majid Majidi, Reza Mir Karimi, and Kamal Tabrizi. At its most expansive, the Ma'anagara project was framed as an inquiry into the ways in which cinema could aid a, a universal human search for meaning. At its most particular, it was a moment made possible by a specific historical experience of cinema, of westernization and American domination, and of revolution and Islamic commitment. In their universalism, the proponents of spiritual cinema shared a modernist vision of film as a medium capable of inspiring ethical and social transformation that can be traced back to the constitutional revolution of the early 20th century. Their attitudes toward Hollywood, on the other hand, departed in subtle but significant ways from some of their more influential, from some of their most influential forebears and critics. Whether participating in the new wave of the 1960s and 70s, the cinema of the sacred defense in the 1980s and later, or the art house movement of the 1990s, Iranian filmmakers and critics often articulated their work in opposition to Hollywood. For these Iranians, Hollywood's bloated commercial fantasies pandered to spectators' base desires for sex, thrills, and violence, rather than enabling critical reflection, understanding, and transcendence. Some went further by blaming Hollywood for enabling American imperial domination, a view of filmic efficacy that they shared with some American policymakers from at least the 1940s onward. Accordingly, these filmmakers set themselves the task of producing alternative cinematic visions, which would be responsive to their local social milieus while remaining globally attuned. Among others, they would draw inspiration from Soviet, Italian neorealist, French New Wave, and Latin American third cinema. The de defenders of the Ma'an al project retained this earlier concern with meaning, transcendence, and spirituality, but they departed from Hollywood's detractors by expanding their field of critical experimentation to include some of those films that their colleagues wrote off as delusive and degenerate. This expansion sometimes went so far as to not only include Hollywood productions, but to place them at the very center of Ma'an al cinema. For example, the Farabi Cinema Foundation published a festival book in 2005 analyzing 49 spiritual films, of which a whopping 25, more than half, were made in the United States. In its introduction, the book claimed that in cinema one could find, quote, the loftiest locus for the manifestation of spirituality and for dialogue among the spiritually minded people of the world. But the book founded its spiritual universalism upon a distorted planetary geography of filmmaking. In this and other expressions of the Matanogato imagination, the foreign films most deserving of discussion had either enjoyed the power and funding of Hollywood or the seal of approval of elite European and North American festivals. The film rosters produced at the height of fascination with spiritual cinema thus made scarce mention of movies from the Arab Middle East or Turkey, barely anything from Africa, only a handful of entries from South and Southeast Asia, and little from Latin America. The specificity of this cosmopolitan imaginary comes further into focus when we juxtapose it against a very different but no less cosmopolitan take on global cinema among Iranian cultural producers. The Resistance International Film Festival is a biennial event organized by the Basij militia in Tehran. The festival originated in 1983 to celebrate films about the sacred defense or the eight-year war against Iraq. Since 2010, the Resistance Festival has accepted foreign entries for competition and screened a selection vetted by a jury. Its aim has been to build a global anti-imperial cultural alliance by encouraging filmmakers from around the world to, quote, create a convergence between their productions and the concepts and terminology of the discourse of Islamic revolution. In 2016, the 10 films included Sorry, the 10 finalists included films from Syria, Morocco, Palestine, Indonesia, Peru, and Slovenia. The festival's call for 
the festival's call for submission suggested topics such as, quote, confronting racial discrimination and American police brutality against people of color, the resistance of the peoples of Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen against Israel and the US, confronting Islamophobia and Iranophobia, confronting the imposition of the Western life lifestyle, and most notably for our purposes, the role of Hollywood in furthering the goals of imperialism. As one might expect, no Hollywood movies were, were included in the program. However, Hollywood productions were indeed screened outside of competition in prior years at the same festival. In 2000, for example, the roster of films included Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan, Oliver Stone's Platoon, Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket, Jean-Jacques Anod's Seven Years in Tibet, and uh, Jean-Jacques Anod's Seven Years in Tibet, Tibet. Even the Basige militia could find something to savor in Hollywood's cinematic offerings. For the advocates of spiritual film at Channel 4 and the Farabi Foundation, Hollywood offered a range of cinematic models and techniques to think with, critique, and even emulate. As we have seen, the Ghetto project proceeded alongside alternative cosmopolitan imaginaries that resisted Hollywood. It also received a number of direct challenges. Not only were the advocates of spiritual cinema forced to reckon with criticism of their conceptualization of ma'ana in film, they were also targeted for their supposed naivete in valorizing degenerate, repugnant, or downright evil Hollywood movies. These criticisms were largely uncoordinated and came from a variety of quarters, but their authors shared a conservative orientation to the politics of culture, in part marked by anxiety about a cultural onslaught, tahajuma farhangi, or soft war, jange narm, that the West waged against Iran society, to undermine piety and social cohesion. The fiercest attacks on spiritual cinema were waged in opposition to Satanism, as propagated by Hollywood film. The ex-Marxist turned Islamist cultural critic Mas'ud Feroz Ati emerged as one of cinema's, spiritual cinema's more learned and philosophically minded detractors. Over the years, Feroz Ati has repeatedly chastised Iranian cultural administrators for failing to properly understand both cinema and ma'ana. As he argued in 2011, quote, with the medium of cinema, the Americans use technology to bamboozle us with pseudo-philosophical concepts. These friends of ours, meaning the Farabi Foundation and uh, Channel 4, are attracted to these vulgar movies that pretend to be philosophical, but are in fact superstitious and sometimes even Satanist. They become interested in extremely superficial and vulgar films like What Dreams May Come. Or one of these learned Muslim friends of ours uh, takes The Truman Show to be a religious film. The point is that they look for motifs, but they don't understand form. This is why the Americans can subject us to whatever calamity they choose. They prepare the world with cinema and then capture it with weapons. But we have not been able to use images ourselves to offer any of our own value-oriented slogans. Ferasati's point was not only that Hollywood films frequently peddled superstition and Satanism in place of spirituality, but also, and more importantly, that Iranian cultural managers failed to recognize the ways in which cinematic form could be deployed for a transformative effect. Hollywood producers took advantage of these forms to propagate their own values, while Iranians satisfied themselves with sloganeering through cultural disseminations in which form and content remained incongruous. Another outspoken critic of Hollywood spirituality was Muhammad Hussein Faraj Nijad, an author who was published widely on Zionism and deviant spirituality in film. Um, here you can see him holding a copy, a Persian translation of the ultimate Harry Potter and philosophy, um, Hogwarts for Muggles. In one of his articles, Faraj Nijad argued that Hollywood had schemed to promote a kind of spirituality aligned with secularism and postmodernism to further Amer American imperial goals. To this end, American movies advertised what he called inverted mysticisms, like Buddhism, Christian mysticism, and Jewish Sufism, which the author equated with Kabbalah, Native American mysticisms, New Age religions, humanistic and secular mysticisms, and Satanism and witchcraft. After laying out a brief history of Zionist complicity with Asians in attacking Islam, which allegedly began with Mongol collaboration with, quote, Jewish and Christian crusaders in the 12th and 13th centuries, he's really out there, this guy. Faraj Najad proceeded to analyze a number of Buddhist themes in Hollywood and non-Hollywood film. In the final page of his essay, he criticized the Farabi Foundation's vague, secular, and derivative definition of spirituality, which he claimed, quote, led to the screening of a Christian satanic movie called uh, Constantine, as the opening film in Channel 4's Cinema and Metaphysics. 
as well as the sanctification, propagation, and rewarding of numerous films of Hollywood Buddhism and Eastern mysticism. By the way, uh, state television in Iran, uh, at least for the past 20 years, has been um, administered, has been managed by conservatives. So this is not a case of ref a reformist administration versus, let's say, a right-wing or a, or, a, or a conservative um, set of critics. It's actually, much of this is, is internal to, the conser to various conservative camps. Hassan Abbasi is a third opponent of Hollywood spirituality who first came to prominence as a firebrand critic of Muhammad Khatami's reformist administration. Known as a maverick public speaker and occasional television commentator, Abbasi leads a small think tank that formulates what he calls strategic doctrines for the Islamic Republic. Abbasi's public lectures include detailed analyses of Hollywood movies and television series, with particular attention to the ways in which these productions advance Zionist strategic interests. One of his better known critiques in the mid-2000s was directed at Constantine, which he described as a Satanist movie that asserted the supremacy of Lucifer, quote, the evilest of the devils, over a demonic new world order. He reserved special barbs for Channel 4, charging that, quote, the idiot who calls himself a cinema expert and broadcasts this anti-religious film on the Islamic Republic's television has become fully fused into Hollywood culture. In the aftermath of the controversial presidential election of 2009, criticisms of Hollywood Satanism sometimes melded with a more diffuse right-wing anxiety about the circulation of Satanist emblems and practices. Anti-Satanist activists noticed suspicious signs, triangles, broken crosses, the eye of Lucifer, and so on, everywhere, on public buildings, subway murals, middle school textbooks, clothing, and jewelry. In February 2010, Tehran police announced that it was banning a popular air freshener in the shape of a black rectangle with a large white X on its face because it carried a symbol of Kabbalism and Satan worship. For a brief period, right-wing activists and bloggers even worried that the newly constructed Majlis building, the parliament, on Bahadistan Square expressed Masonic and Satanist meanings because it was designed in the shape of a pyramid. In the meantime, the media carried police reports about the proliferation of Satan-worshipping cults in which young men and women danced to heavy metal music, performed grotesque and sometimes violent rituals, consumed alcohol and illegal drugs, and engaged in dangerous sexual behavior. The anti-Satanists formulated their criticisms in terms of a worry over foreign influence and the corruption of a pious Muslim interior. The principal narrative about Satanic signs was that they silently advertised Satanism and insinuated themselves into the minds of their beholders in order gradually to infect them with doubt, irreligion, and immorality. In some formulations, these tokens were imbued with a supernatural talismanic force mediated by demonic otherworldly beings. In the most alarmist accounts, the emblems foretold cataclysmic events yet to come. For example, Ali Akbar Efipur, a public speaker with a cult following among right-wing student groups, claimed that the X in the band air freshener signified the imminent manifestation of Satan and enslavement to his rule. That the sign should be circulating so openly, he claimed, could only be a herald of the end times and Masonic, Masonic plans to, insinu to institute a new world order. We may read these anti-Satanist utterances as expressions of counter-cosmopolitanism to the extent that they betray anxieties about border crossing and cultural pollution. As strident as the anti-Satanists were in their denunciations of dangerous flows, however, their discourse was itself fundamentally shaped by circulations connecting Iran to the US. The kernel of right-wing Iranian criticisms of Hollywood spirituality, the notion that uh, Jews control the US film industry and use movies to further their strategic interests, has long served as a cornerstone of white supremacist conspiracism in the United States. The Iranian version of this discourse can partly be credited to American organizations like the National Vanguard and white supremacists like David Duke and Mark Weber. The Iranian anti-Satanists similarly borrowed the concept of a new world order from American right-wing populists and Christian evangelicals, preoccupied with the looming apocalypse. The very epistemology and methodology of anti-Satanist detective work, hunting for visual tokens in public spaces as proof of conspiracy, was imported from abroad. Even the inventory of satanic emblems, which appeared on countless anti-Satanist blogs and was displayed at university events on Satanism, was translated from a handful of English language sources, like the Christian fundamentalist web forum, ExposingSatanism.org. In drawing attention to the global circulations that shaped Iranian anti-Satanic discourse, I am not trying to reveal hypocrisy, irony, or incoherence in the anti-Satanist stance 
toward foreign influence. What I want to argue instead is that self-conscious antagonism to cultural pollution can itself depend on openness to external epistemic authority and syncretistic forms of borrowing. Not all forms of mixture, that is, need to be experienced as polluting. At issue is not so much a conflict between the attitudes of openness and hostility toward outsiders as a question over which aspects of an external other's knowledge and power can be usefully assimilated in the service of combating other undesirable elements. Alleged counter-cosmopolitans may, on closer inspection, be cosmopolitans too. While the anti-Satanists had no qualms about admitting the cru that crucial aspects of their discourse were imported from the West, they prefer to conceal their sources' specific ideological proclivities. Thus, none of the anti-Satanists with whose work I am familiar acknowledged borrowing from white supremacists and apocalyptic Christian fundamentalists. Even when they mentioned an organization like the National Vanguard and individuals like David Duke, these activists failed to disclose their American counterparts' white supremacist leanings. The power of anti-Satanist discourse, therefore, depended on a form of cosmopolitan openness that had to remain covert in order to avoid embarrassment. It would be embarrassing for them to say, you know, we are drawing from white, white supremacists, you know, in case that's not clear. Um, in 2011, I spoke with several anti-Satanist activists about the circulations of Satanic emblems in order to understand the semiotic ideology that underpinned their discourse and practice. For those of you who don't know this term, semiotic ideology merely means uh, uh, conceptions about how symbols work in the world. My interlocutors explain the efficacy of these signs either by recourse to mystical energetic flows or in terms of psychological suggestion. A medical student and activist named Amin described the influence of satanic emblems as a form of energy transfer. The world, he told me, is a world of energy. You are constantly exchanging energy with the environment around you. When you hold the Quran close to your chest, you absorb energy and feel a sense of calm. In the same way, if you have contact with something with a negative charge, in my example, a satanist sign, it will cause negative effects like mental disturbance, loss of self-awareness, and growing distant from God. Mahdi, another student activist, told me how his own friend had been infected. A good student in high school with pious appearance and conduct, he had begun watching American and European television series on bootleg DVDs. According to Mahdi, quote, these series, especially the ones that have come out in recent years, are full of satanic signs. One of his friend's favorites was Supernatural a series about the paranormal pursuits of two demon-hunting brothers, which still, I believe, is um, on air after, like, 12 years or something. It's awful. Um, I've, I've seen a few episodes, but, um, for work purposes. Uh, <laughs> uh, after exposing himself to the series for some time, Mahdi explained, uh, his friend started to dress and groom himself like a central character um, in the film. He even organized his room and belongings in a way so as to resemble him, to appear classy, bokelos, as Mahdi put it. After two or three years, Mahdi realized that it was not only his friend's appearance that had gradually become, um, that had gradually shifted, his faith had also been transformed. He was taking bits and pieces of beliefs from Supernatural and other series, leading him to question God's justice and omnipotence. He then started to skip some of his daily obligatory prayers. At this point, Mahdi intervened, realizing that his friend was headed for, quote, denial of God and the worship of nothingness. <coughs> he had a serious conversation with his friend in an attempt to return him to the straight path, and he seemed to be satisfied with the result. It will be too easy to write off these accounts as folk theories about cultural circulation motivated by conservative paranoia over pollution and declining religious observance. But by pointing to the hidden workings of signs and their filmic vehicles. The anti-Satanists usefully highlight an aspect of circulation that cannot be grasped by focusing on self-conscious attitudes toward global flows, whether those we might characterize as cosmopolitan or counter-cosmopolitan. They draw attention, that is, to an occult efficacy that may be a condition of possibility for both openness and antagonism toward otherness. This is an efficacy that works not so much at the level of overt discourse with its rules of persuasion and coherence, but on the deeper structures of affect, desire, and perception. One way to think of this occult efficacy is to draw on the psychoanalytic concepts of fantasy and identification. On this account, Mahdi, explained, the, the anti-Satanist activist, explained how his friend came to identify with a character from Supernatural, 
The filmic fantasy shaped his desire to become the character, granting this desire a specific substance, direction, and schema that would teach him how certain real-world objects, like styles of dress, modes of comportment, possessions, even beliefs, could become desirable to him. But this would be to provide a theory for Mahdi's interpretation of his friend's experience, not an account of the experience itself, nor even of uh, Mahdi's friend's interpretation of it, to which I have no access. So I don't know what his friend thought was happening to him when he was watching the series, right? All I know is what the friend interpreted to be happening to, to him. We can reformulate the problem then as follows. It is not so much that Mahdi's friend identified with Supernatural's filmic fantasy, but that Mahdi's belief that his friend did so sustained an ideological fantasy of Hollywood's preternatural efficaciousness. There is still an occult efficacy at work here, but it is immediately apparent in Mahdi's rather than his friend's Hollywood encounter. Mahdi's friend may or may not have been in thrall of Hollywood, but Mahdi himself certainly was. I want to examine this anti-Satanist fascination with Hollywood, the idea that Hollywood images have the power to unilaterally reshape Iranian subjectivities, in terms of what William Mazzarella, following Peter Sloterdijk, has called constitutive resonance. With resonance, Mazzarella wants to identify a relationship through which people and things mutually constitute one another. Resonant encounter, he writes, quote, is a way of thinking about the making and unmaking of selves and worlds, as well as the attachments of selves to the worlds in which they can feel alive, usually by means of some ambivalent combination of affirmation and refusal, end quote. The feeling of recognition in the moment of resonance can be satisfying, exciting, fulfilling, and so on, but it can also cause anxiety, dread, or repulsion about losing oneself in the other. So imagine, I mean, one of Mazzarella's examples is when you see something, uh, you see, let's say, a, a piece of clothing, or you see a, a piece of jewelry, or uh, a chocolate, or whatever, and you say, this is what I always wanted, right? The, the recognition that this is what you always wanted happens in the encounter with that thing. If it's something you always wanted, right, but you didn't name it before, right, it means that you didn't know that you always wanted it until that encounter happened, right? So for him, that moment of the encounter between the person, the desiring subject, and the thing is that moment when both things become constituted, right, as the desiring person and as the thing desired, right? So that's, that's what I'm getting at with this. And, there's, and there, it's not only a moment of desire, it could also be repugnance, it could be, you know, I hate this thing, and it could be some ambivalent feeling of both attachment and a, a feeling of um, being repelled or terrified. Um, so, um, and of course, uh, so repulsion about losing oneself and the other, right? This idea that I want it, but I don't want to want it, right? I want it too much, and so on. This is uh, the psychoanalysis and, uh, you know, what, what um, Mazzarella is getting at with, uh, by drawing on Sloterdijk really helps to think about some of these complex forms of attachment. Was it an accident that according to Mahdi, the figure in whom his friend supposedly lost himself was an American demon hunter? Could Mahdi's anxiety about Hollywood's satanic nihilistic reach have had something to do with an ambivalent resonance he felt between Supernatural's demon hunter and his own self as a soul-saving activist? Even more terrifying could it be that it was only in encountering a figure like the Hollywood demon hunter that Mahdi found himself as an activist striving to, striving to save souls from Hollywood's demons. It is important to stress that the resonant relationship is constitutive on both sides. It, is not only, it not only makes a person like Mahdi into a subject who ambivalently desires and is repulsed by Hollywood, but also shapes a Hollywood image like that of the demon hunter into something desirable, classy, repulsive, and terrifying. The image is none of these things before the encounter. Certainly no one in Hollywood could have predicted, much less planned, precisely this kind of resonance. But to the extent that Mahdi's encounter prompts discourse and action, that is to the extent that it incites, recharges, and recalibrates the specific social forms associated with what I'm calling anti-Satanist activism, it also enables further resonances of this sort, even if it can never be repeated in precisely the same way. In other words, it can travel, it can be mimicked, and so on. Let me now return to, the two, to two of the examples with which I began my presentation. In summer 2006, my friend Ahmad, the Arabic instructor, told me that the Lord of the Rings provided accurate representations of various tribes of jinn. To justify his claim, he told me of a dramatic encounter in which he faced off against a terrifying jinn that was possessing one of his students who had earlier been diagnosed with schizophrenia. The encounter occurred in what he called a true dream, 
in which Ahmed was ascending a building while pulling his student by the hand. The jinn hung on to the student, wide-eyed, bearing its fangs, like some of the menacing beings in Peter Jackson's films. Ahmed brought his right fist down toward the jinn, directing his semi-precious ring, which was set with Quranic inscriptions, against the creature. The jinn shrieked and released the young man, plummeting into the darkness below. In winter 2008, I enrolled in seminars with an underground mystical group called Cosmic Mysticism. The group held weekly treatment sessions in a private apartment and exercised about a dozen patients each time. And I'm going to show you a clip of one of these exorcisms. The person you, you see here is Muhammad Ali Tahiri, who is the exorcist, and he's also the founder of this group. And they, this is the group's own, uh, they uploaded this themselves. Okay, that's enough. But basically what happens in these exorcisms, and there's, I have a lot more detail um, about this uh, in several chapters of the book, is there's a conversation that happens between the exorcist and the, the demon-possessed person through which the act of healing um, ultimately happens. I often spoke about the exorcisms with my friend Bob Eck, a master's student in business administration who attended the seminars with me. After our first visit to a treatment session, he told me that when I watched the movie Constantine, it never occurred to me that any of it might be real until I came here. In my interactions with the instructor and some of his students, I learned that Constantine and The Exorcist were two of their favorite films. They exchanged copies of the movies among themselves, not only for entertainment, but also as visual commentary on aspects of their teachings, including the exorcisms. How are we to make sense of these examples? Ahmed remarked to me that the fact that certain creatures in the Lord of the Rings resemble jinn like the one in his dream suggested that Peter Jackson or someone in his crew had actually encountered jinn before making the films. For Ahmed then, these films took on an aspect of documentary realism. The cosmic mystics too argued that movies like The Exorcist and Constantine amounted to faithful representations of reality. They found it unsurprising that their healing rituals resembled filmic exorcism. If anything, the resemblance offered circular proof that both kinds of exorcism were, un, uh, un, were authentic and unstaged. These accounts provide causal explanations for the resemblances between, on the one hand, real life beings and experiences, jinn and exorcisms, and on the other hand, the images of Hollywood horror and fantasy. It might be tempting to turn the causal tables around and suggest contra my interlocutors, that the reason they dreamt of jinn and experienced exorcisms that look like Hollywood images was that they all, dreamers, exorcists, and the possessed, had previously watched The Lord of the Rings, Constantine, and The Exorcist, thereafter internalizing their images and enabling certain modes of identification. But both kinds of causal explanation depend on something that is logically prior, a relationship of constitutive resonance that emerges through a protracted encounter and produces the very terms that are subsequently ex post facto linked in causal association. Ahmed's dream image and Peter Jackson's orcs had to resonate together as jinn before a causal relationship could be identified between them. Otherwise, how did he, uh, someone like Ahmed know that what he's seeing on the film screen is the jinn, right? Or what he's seeing in his, in his dream is a jinn. Similarly, the cosmic mystic's healing and Keanu Reeves' demon hunting had to resonate together as jinn exorcisms before anyone could explain how or why. Subject and object, thing and representation, image and reality were all mutually constituted through extended moments of encounter. The filmic resonances I've described point to a kind of cosmopolitanism, a form of spiritual reflex, uh, sorry, a form of spiritual receptivity to foreign others that is neither overt nor covert. For both of these depend on self-conscious, even if strategically concealed openness. Instead, this is an occult receptivity one whose workings remain hidden and mysterious, 
subject as they are to the vagaries of unconscious attachments and aversions, identifications and disidentifications. Occult cosmopolitans neither embrace nor reject Hollywood, but are Hollywood possessed, by which I mean not only that their subjectivities are colonized by Hollywood images, but also that they in turn possess Hollywood film, giving it a distinctive spiritual significance and signifying power, a special kind of ma'ana, if you like. The very same occult relationship that enables these cosmopolitans to see and experience spiritual phenomena through Hollywood also makes Hollywood cinema into a medium through which to see and experience the spiritual world in distinctive ways. To conclude, I've described three ways in which Hollywood films have mediated Iranian receptivity to cultural and religious others as they grapple with spiritual and metaphysical realms. In overt cosmopolitanism, such as we find in the Farabi Cinema Foundation's Ma'ana Gera project, Hollywood movies were openly screened, critiqued, and analyzed for their contributions to reimagining filmic spirituality. Here, openness toward global cinema went hand in hand with a constricted imagination of the global that effectively ignored the cinematic creativity taking place outside of Hollywood and the circuits of prestigious festivals. With covert, sorry, with covert cosmopolitanism, right-wing critics' antagonism toward American cultural flows was partly enabled by American conspiracist discourse and its associated hermeneutic strategies and semiotic ideologies. The policing of cultural borders thus relied on a kind of openness to external epistemic authority that could only be efficacious as long as some of its dimensions remained unmarked and unacknowledged. In occult cosmopolitanism, finally, receptivity toward Hollywood evaded conscious articulation altogether and instead took the form of deep-seated deep -seated resonances and ambivalent attachments. On the surface, occultists' grasp of spiritual reality was shaped by a relationship of reference and citation involving Hollywood film. That's what we see when someone says, here is what Jin looked like, right, pointing at a movie. Below the surface, however, there lurked an occult relationship of resonance, identification, and capillary efficacy that both re-signified the image and remade the spectator. How might we think these three modes of cosmopolitanism in relation to one another? In their dynamics of receptivity and closure, we can think of overt and covert cosmopolitanism as two sides of the same coin. Avowed openness to some forms of difference is often accompanied by closure toward others. And conversely, open antagonism to some cultural circulations goes hand in hand with receptivity before other flows. This is why I find distinctions between cosmopolitanism and counter cosmopolitanism, as in the well known articulation by the philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah to be less useful than the resonant entanglements that ground both what we think of as receptivity and non-receptivity to otherness. If openness and hostility to cultural difference depends on hidden resonances, it becomes difficult to distinguish the cosmopolitan from the counter-cosmopolitan inasmuch as both orientations are constituted in ways that not only escape their subject's consciousness and control, but are regularly misperceived as their opposites. And we could say something also about um, what the ethics of cosmopolitanism actually also uh, entails in, in this kind of situation, which I'm not going to get into. Attention to constitutive resonance may enable a more complex understanding of the diffuse ways in which power shapes cosmopolitan subjectivities. A crucial dimension of these resonances is their historical contingency, instability, and ambivalence. What resonates one way now may later resonate otherwise, rearranging cosmopolitan attachments in the process. So I'll close by elaborating on one example we've already encountered, the X air freshener. It so happened that the X air fresheners making the rounds in Tehran and other cities that year were identical to promotional items commissioned in 1992 by the late Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X's widow, days before the theatrical release of Spike Lee's Malcolm X. It is likely that the same product or knockoffs eventually made their way to Iran, shedding their original promotional referent in the process. Malcolm X is widely revered in Iranian state discourse. On February 21, 2017, the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Khamenei, inaugurated a conference in support of the Palestinian Intifada by calling on participants to recite a prayer for Malcolm X, since the day coincided with the anniversary of his assassination. Over three decades earlier, in 1983, Malcolm X's autobiography was translated to Persian and published by a major press. The following year, Iran produced a postage stamp commemorating the Universal Day of Struggle Against Race Discrimination, with Malcolm X depicted in Hajj attire and reciting the call to prayer. When Lee's biopic was released in 1992, Iranian publications covered the event with analyses and critiques, 
more recently, the film was dubbed into Persian and broadcast several times on state television. For most of the past 35 years, Malcolm X has acted as an emblem for the Islamic Republic's anti-racist, anti-imperial cosmopolitanism, a revolutionary universalism that has no trouble incorporating Hollywood cinematic power when necessary. But for a brief anxious moment, X resonated as a sign of Satan shot through with occidentophobic paranoia. Perhaps this contrapuntal resonance was only made possible by decontextualization and ignorance. If only the anti-Satanists knew that the air freshener was a promotional referent, was a promotional item for Spike Lee's film, their concerns would have been dispelled. But maybe the ability to resonate as Satan was already a feature of the cinematic Malcolm X, as well as his pre-filmic incarnations. In Alex Haley's telling, Malcolm X describes his rebellious anti-religious days in prison, where he earned the nickname Satan, as he would, quote, pace for hours like a caged leopard, viciously cursing the Bible and God. Lee's film adaptation depicts copious amounts of irreligious behavior, including a moment in solitary confinement when Malcolm taunts the prison chaplain by calling out to Jesus to kiss my ass, uh, something that's actually um, uh, completely changed in the Persian uh, version of it. Uh, I can, if you want, I can tell you what, what the Persian says. It's not kiss my ass to Jesus. Um, nothing even close to blasphemous. Uh, eventually, these textual and filmic narratives show Malcolm X prevailing over Satan. In the film, the moment of his, poli of his political awareness as X is represented with the utterance, I ain't Malcolm Little, I ain't Red, I damn sure ain't Satan. But in a psychoanalytic reading, we could say that Satan remains part of a fundamental antagonism, one that the narrative attempts to resolve by rearranging its terms into a temporal succession, but can never fully overcome. So this is something that psychoanalytic film theorists have talked about, how if you look at um, film narrative, what it often does is there's, there's some kind of antagonistic situation, some tension that the narrative overcomes over time. right? Um, but in fact, this, this is a fantastical representation. And what the fantasy is doing is it's resolving attention by making it into, by, by sort of rearranging it, right? So if you um, um, both are powerful and uh, disempowered, right, it's the disempowered moment becomes the moment of empowerment so that you, you overcome your disempowered status, right? But that's a fantastical representation. Could it be that the satanic X was not so much the mistaken identity of an otherwise wholesome global ally, but the index of an unruly element that destabilizes even those cosmopolitan attachments that seem most secure? As I have shown, Hollywood cinema has granted Iranians a useful set of external reference with and against which to define their distinctive modes of spiritual cosmopolitanism. But beneath these self-conscious acts of reference, we can also read Hollywood for clues as to the myriad ways in which things might resonate otherwise. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions, yes. I was wondering, uh, I assume you, you interviewed uh, these people like Mahdi you mentioned, right? Yeah. Uh, what is, uh, did ever the name of uh, Rumi or Shams come up? Uh, because they, they should be considered Satanists by them. Right. Um, th I mean, there are, not, not in my conversations, but um, there are anti-Satanist activists who really dislike Sufi poetry. Yeah, and they, they I mean, the, um, there's, a, there's really a range, too, of uh, what I'm calling anti-Satanism. Um, what I've given you is sort of the far right fringe of it. Um, there are, there are sort of more mild versions of it that see dangers in Hollywood film and see kind of uh, polluting elements, let's say, or uh, morally corrupting elements in Hollywood film, right? Um, but don't necessarily go so far as to say, you know, there's this giant conspiracy and, uh, you know, and that, that, that this pervades everything and so on and so forth. Um, so this, what I'm talking about is kind of that extreme fringe. And yes, in some parts of it, Sufi poetry would also be implicated in one way or another, even though that's less on the, for, that's less on the, 
kind of on the forefront of that discourse. Masnavi was considered majest by the religious, right? Some of them. Uh, and they, some mullahs would read it using, right. you know, and more because they didn't want to touch the book. Right. I mean, I, I, yes and, and, and no in the sense that there's also a very strong kind of mystical, mostly elite mystical trend within uh, clerical Shiism, right? So um, not Sufism, right? I mean, there, there is Sufism, um, but there's also from the 16th century onwards at least, there's an elite form of mysticism that takes Sufi poetry uh, as some of the highest forms of expression of of uh, ma'ana, right, of meaning and of spirituality. So, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini famously, right, himself was enamored of Rumi, he was enamored of Ibn Arabi and, you know, of Hafiz, and there are, there are stories about clerics who, uh, um, e even during certain parts of the prayer, will have, w would have recited Hafiz poetry, right? So you have that, and then you also have people who are adamantly against it. And the, the opposition can also take very different forms. Um, thank you so much. This is a, a really interesting talk. Um, I want to kind of uh, follow up on the question of sort of anti-Satan activism or anti-Satanist activism. Um, you've kind of made clear how the sort of Hollywood symbols circulate through film festivals, through bootleg DVDs, these things. Um, and when you were describing some of the kind of anti-Satanist discourse, it definitely reminded me of kind of videos that are widely available on YouTube if you look, you know, look for Illuminati, et cetera, et cetera you know, millions of videos like that. So I was curious where, kind of in what forums the anti-Satanist discourse circulates? Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a number of forms. Um, sometimes it's online. Uh, I mean, there, there are uh, YouTube channels, uh, blogs. I mean, there used to be blogs. I mean, there's fewer blogs now. Um, some of those videos actually are dubbed. I mean, I mean, the first person I mentioned as an anti-Satanist activist, uh, he was introduced to me by someone else as a person who was translating one of these uh, uh, kind of New World Order, Freemasonry kind of things uh, to Persian. And so it was, I mean, and I asked, I mean, he had, there was no desire on his part to hide anything. It was like he was, this is a documentary and I'm translating it to Persian, right? So there is that and then there's, um, there are certain public events. So there was a university, um, a, a student organized conference in 2009 that I attended at, uh, at um, Alamutabu Tabai University, where there were a number of speakers and um, the, the speaker, there were three or four speakers and they spoke in different ways. They were brought in as experts. There was a, there was a, um, a sociologist who was a deputy in the Tehran police force for social affairs. And he talked about music, heavy metal music, and its relationship to Satanism. There was a uh, professor of uh, communications at the University of Tehran who spoke. And he was the most, um, I think, nuanced. Uh, and he, he, he was talking mostly about the relationship of uh, music in the United States and Satanism. But nothing that he said really was not true. I mean, there, he was talking about groups like Black Sabbath and um, uh, Marilyn, Marilyn Manson and, and you know, um, groups that are very unabashed about their, their, their Satanism. And he, and he also said that, look, when they're saying we're Satanists, it doesn't mean that they're worshiping Satan as some kind of metaphysical figure, right? It doesn't mean that there's some kind of spiritual, or sorry, supernatural component to this. It has certain kinds of meanings in that particular context. And there was also a, um, a cleric who was at the time a PhD student in religious studies, I believe, at, um, in Edinburgh. And he wanted to study alternative religious, or new religious um, movements. And at the time he was, uh, in, in there he was presenting also on Satanism. So there's, there's this kind of public type forum. Here, the, the one that I'm talking about was more of a discussion-based thing, but then there's others that are more like lectures. So 
Ali Akbar Raifipu, who I've mentioned, he's often, he was often invited by right-wing student groups to come and discuss things like, you know, how do we interpret Hollywood film? How do we interpret video games? You know, he famously had this one uh, speech where he said that uh, Super Mario Brothers and, uh, and uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, if you put them together, Mario and Sonic, it comes in a Sonic. Um, <laughs> and, and, and you can tell, uh, there's, there's even the white gloves that they wear. Why is it that all these cartoon characters wear white gloves, I wonder? You know? uh, Mickey Mouse, you know, all the, Mickey Mouse definitely. Um, all the way to Sonic, and you know, that's, that's a clear sign of, of their Masonic affiliations. So you know, there's, there's also that kind of stuff. But again, I mean, what I want to emphasize is that there are these guys, and they're also sort of in a, in a context where they're, they're ridiculed by other groups, and they're kind of fiercely debating with uh, still others. And, and it's, it can't be neatly divided in a sort of a reformist versus conservative um, frame, even though most of what I'm talking about has a clear right-wing orientation. It's kind of on the far right of, of the spectrum. I was wondering if um, uh, spiritual or cult connotations are applied to any American superhero movies like Avengers, X Men, whatnot. For and sure. if, if so, what is the like? What's the most contentious character or storyline? Uh, that I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, uh, there are a lot of commentaries on superhero films. Um, I haven't followed the last few years, um, but the I, in the I mentioned this book uh, that the Fadavi Institute put out in I think it was two thousand nine, was two thousand ten or something like this, two thousand nine I believe. Uh, sorry, two thousand yeah, well whatever around two thousand nine. And uh, one of the films that they that they had selected of, from the '49 was Hulk, it was the first Hulk film, and Hulk as a spiritual film. So there he was talking about not not in a negative way, right? This author was saying, here are some ways in which this movie represents spiritual topics, right? And you have to also understand that they're not necessarily these guys aren't necessarily the proponents of spiritual film. They're not necessarily saying this is the right way to represent spirituality, they're saying here are some ways in which spirituality is represented, right? So, you know, this character sort of transformations, humans' potential supernatural powers, right? And so on and so forth. Um, but th this was a more neutral slash positive kind of representation, and then there's negative ones. I know X-Men um, are, th th there's been a lot of videos, I think Rafi Puru I've talked about, I've seen him with kind of against the X-Men posters talking about X-Men as particularly nefarious. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be able to say what is the most. Yeah, and I think it's the, you know, the X, that there's something there for sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your fascinating talks. I think as part of your argument, you mentioned that the antecedents deploy uh, white supremacist arguments. I didn't understand that. Could you explain that, please? Um, so the white supremacist arguments that they make are the arguments about uh, Jewish conspiracy behind the propagation of, uh, so Jewish conspiracy to use films as a form of global domination. That's what they very explicitly draw from uh, people like David Duke and Mark Weber. And there, you know, there are translated interviews with Weber. There's, there's a book by David Duke about um, uh, I want to say it's about film, but I might be mistaken. Um, uh, or some component of it that might be about film that have been translated to Persian, right? Um, those are the white supremacists. And then the ones that are do more of a kind of a um, uh, emblem hunting, deciphering, you know, those kinds of things, they're not so much the white supremacists necessarily as mostly fundamentalist types. But there, there are also some kind of NRO, you know, net, New World Order, NWOs, um, New World Order, you know, right-wing groups that also make those kinds of associations. And a lot of these things really blend together when you look online, right? Not necessarily in some of the prominent figures. 
over here. So. Um, yeah, kind of off of that point, I was uh, hoping to elaborate on an image you had earlier of the Satanist jewelry. Um, and I noticed there were swastikas among that. So were those identified as Satanist symbols? And if so, how does that connect it to the association of Zionism with the Satanism? Um, it seems yeah, over here. Dirty, kind of. Yeah, yeah, right here. Oops. Did I pass it? It's over here. Um, so this, this image was, uh, it was posted on a news website that was talking about how uh, the police is now uh, looking at uh, sort of certain jewelry that is that, that is being sold in, uh, in jewelry shops to to make sure that they're okay, right? So they didn't identify necessarily the swastika directly. Um, I I think I've seen uh, sorry I think I've I think I've seen the swastika identified as a satanic sign. Um, I can't really sort of you know tell you right now, but um, there are, there, there were points when I, I had conversations with people and I pointed out certain things that I thought were inconsistencies, right? So for example, in the, uh, and, and this will give you a hint of a possible explanation for this, right? It might not be the explanation because that might not actually be considered one. That's, that's a satanic sign. But the, I was at the at this conference that I mentioned at Anomatawa uh, University and um, the, uh, there was a video that was played from Bowling for Columbine, and where um, Michael Moore in interviews uh, Marilyn Manson, right? Because the shooters at Columbine, the two kids said that they had been inspired by, or that, or that they they had listened to Marilyn Manson music or something like this. And then, so Michael Moore goes to Marilyn Manson and talks to him and says, you know, what do you think about all this? And in the clip where this is being shown. Um, there are these protesters uh, standing outside of uh, at a concert uh, where Marilyn Manson is performing, and um, one of the speakers, the, the, the speaker who was invented, uh, who was invited, was a well-known pro-Israel senator uh, from the U.S. Senate, um, and I, I'm, I have to I have to think to remember his name, but he was a very known, a very well-known Democratic senator who later shifted and became centrist, or maybe. Um, so I asked, I asked a question. I said, "Look, you're saying that the, you know, this kind of Satanism is a Zionist project. At the same time, you have a representative of Zionism at this protest, and he's protesting against Marilyn Manson, yeah. right? How can you reconcile those two things?" And one of the speakers, the cleric who's studying new religious movements, he said, "Well, you know, I mean, he, he basically gave an explanation that could be an explanation for anything. I mean, he said, well, you know, uh, sometimes." a group will both create the phenomenon and the opposition to it, right, in order to sort of hide themselves behind the, the event, right? And I, well, I said, well, I mean, that, that can't really be the explanation. I mean, it, there was, the building had um, brickwork uh, in, in, in its interior design that looked like an inverted cross, and I asked them, well, you know, there's inverted crosses in this building. Are you saying that this amphitheater was built by Satanists, you know? And said, no, you know, we know something about the background of these people. It's like, well, I mean, but you're saying that this is the explanation for the background, right? So anyway, all this to say that the, 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 the explanations don't necessarily always cohere um, in, in, in kind of, you, such that it allows a certain kind of expansiveness in interpreting symbols. I think we had a question here. Uh, yeah, my question is about the particular form of the James supernatural Constantine, all taking video form, and then the uh, video you showed of the exorcism. So if you could speak more about how that influences um, people's reaction, um, uh, as opposed to reading a book, which might also be in global circulation. You mean why is it that video in particular? Um, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer. The closest suggestion I can give is that there's something about verisimilitude in, uh, in, in, in sort of uh, special effects, right? In that the special effects in cinematic representations attempt to come as close as possible to real-world visual experience, 
right? So that when you see a jinn kind of next to a human the way that you actually see humans, right? I suspect that that's why that aspect of the technologically mediated uh, verisimilitude, that that's why these are particularly compelling. Um, now, I, it would be really interesting to look at older representations and ask if, let's say, the um, visual depictions of jinn in, a, in an ajaib name, right, from the medieval period or the early modern period, whether those were also taken in some way as, um, as, as kind of, as, as factually close, right, to the representation, and perhaps also in some way being coming close to the way that people experience jinn, either in dreams or in waking experience. Um, I don't know that, but I, it never happened that someone told me this is very similar, that the, that the video representation is very similar to a pictorial representation, right? What I would often hear would be that they would say the video representation is very similar to um, received reports, right? What we've heard about what jinn look like, which could come from religious sources, but it could come from all kinds of other sources, right? It could be someone claimed that they've seen a jinn. Right, which and there's there's stories of like just just like there's story ghost stories, right? Um, so yeah, but I haven't seen an association between the pictorial necessarily and the cinematic. Yes. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I want to say I thought the flickering light was a nice touch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had to do gravity there before talking about. But um, the question I had was. In terms of covert cosmopolitanism, uh, as you talk about it, if you were to talk to someone who had sort of Western influence in their anti-Satanic beliefs, and you brought up the fact that they were themselves Western influence, just as much as maybe like the guy's friend who watched Supernatural books, <clears throat> what, have you done that? And then if you have, what have reactions to that kind of conclusion been? Yeah, so I asked, that's a good question. I mean, I asked um, the guy who was translating the films. I said, so you're translating this, where did you get this film? And he said, oh, it's online, you know. So it was a very matter-of-fact kind of statement. And I think, um, to me, what that suggests is that the very idea that something is Western, quote-unquote, and that label is either something that can be po positively or negatively evaluated, right? That's not a question that always comes up, right? In the same way that, say, a scientific truth statement, right? If you ask, you know, is Neptune the eighth planet in the solar system, right? People don't necessarily label that a Western uh, knowledge, a, a Western truth statement. Right? It doesn't come up as that because it doesn't necessarily, the source of that knowledge isn't necessarily uh, localized right? in a particular historical or um, sort of religious or cultural background. Right? I mean, it should be if you take the insights of, say, science studies right, or history of science, that, that kind of localization is what scholars often do. Um, but there, there's certain kinds of knowledge take on universal qualities, right? In the same way that nobody ever in, in Iran necessarily problematizes the fact that Einstein was uh, European, German, Jewish, any of those things, right? Um, you know, he, he's a universal figure. I mean, there's even, there's, there's poetry from the mid-20th century, I think, um, no, not not Khoda. Um, uh, Shahriar, I think it's Shahriar. He has a poem where uh, he compares Einstein to Muslim mystics, right? And what's happening there is that it's really his background is not as important as the fact that he's a, he's a figure who is speaking universal truths, right? So I think that's that's something that in a way comes to the fore here. How that actually happens, I mean, it's it's interesting to see how that happens. It seems to have something to do with the compelling nature, how, how some kinds of statements, some kinds of images take on compelling force. Right? Once it, if, if someone finds it compelling, then the question as to whether, you know, what, where this is coming from and whether we should be distrustful of the source doesn't even come up. 
are exclusively seen in Shia communities? Or like, does it stem from like kind of a need to protect this re religious identity? Or is it more of a like political nationalistic like, po like stance against that? You mean the anti-Satanism? Yeah. Um, it's very hard to say. I mean, uh, what I would say is that there's a very particular historical moment at which this kind of anti-Satanist um, critique of Hollywood has emerged, right? And it's, um, and and for me, what's interesting is that it emerged at the very same time as the interest in Hollywood horror, as a potentially as as potentially saying something valuable about spirituality, right? So the, the interest in it and the kind of the antagonism toward it sort of emerged roughly around the same time. But it also emerged at a time when there was quite a bit of political tension, right, around the presidential protests in 2009, for example, right? The, the reaction to the protests, the, the accusation that there was uh, fraudulent, um, uh, uh, you know, that the election was stolen and so on. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily about Shiism, per se. I mean, there are ways in which you can trace back the concern with ma'ana, right? The idea that there's, a, there's um, meaningful spiritual expression through pictorial representation, right? There's a certain way in which that can be traced back to a particular f uh, strand within Islamic philosophy. And that is a strand that has been very uh, deliberately kind of articulated over time, right? Um, it goes back to at least the 1980s with uh, uh, war, war documentary filmmaking. Um, and um, there's, there's people have written about this, um, about the way in which uh, there's a kind of a genre of documentary filmmaking that attempts not just to represent what happened, but to create a certain kind of truth, right? So by presenting what is happening on the war front, you create a kind of a transformative spiritual experience, right? And then some people who theorize these kinds of, and some of the filmmakers who were um, um, creating these documentaries, they explicitly connected their uh, forms of visual um, representation and visual expression to Islamic Illuminationist philosophy, right, and that has a as a background that is seeped in steeped in. Um, uh, I mean, not exclusively uh, Shia Islam, but certainly in mystical Islamic expressions, right. But I wouldn't say you know that it's necessarily a sectarian kind of um, uh, thing, and it, it it would be interesting to see whether there are other kinds of. Um, Either, 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 sort of the positive side of valorizing certain kinds of film for their potential for spiritual uplift or transformation, or the negative side, right? Whether that exists in other contexts, I'm sure it does. I mean, for all, the, I'm, I'm talking about this as a global form of circulation, and there's others who, from all these countries that I talked about, who saw something in, uh, saw something valuable in engaging in that conversation, right? That they're that they are trying to do some things that are similar, right? In using the form of cinema as uh, in order to experiment with spiritual topics. Thank you so much. It was really uh, interesting. Um, um, so I grew up in North Africa, in the, in in Sudan, and we, you have a possession all the time there, and people who've never been to cinemas or or know anything to do with different languages. And yet, in that form of possession, they speak English fluently, and they um, they act in very bizarre ways, and um, and yet that form of possession, you can call it, um, like like you've 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 shown in a in a couple of cli uh, clips, that they have they, there is a way of uh, removing the the Satan basically, mm -hmm. who comes in different forms, so there is. That has been going on for years in both um, the southern part of Egypt and and North uh, and Sudan and to some extent also Eritrea and Ethiopia. Um, so that's one th that for you to sort of think about what what form does those kinds of possession also take with uh, outside of the film sort of genre. Another thing that I thought was interesting, the three figures that you showed. Um, <coughs> 
um, the, the, Z, the, the letter A in the middle mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the I, the Egyptian sort of I, um, and then the, la the third one is this, the, uh, the, the star kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, the last two I have seen to the, uh, the, just a few months back in Carrara, because the letter A is, is actually the symbol of anarchists. Mm -hmm. So this has now taken a satanic symbol and here it says, yeah, here too it says anarchy, see? So this is, I mean, this is partly what I'm talking about with kind of wow. the, the radical openness of uh, some of the, so, so the, of interpretation, right? That something like even the anarchy sign, s some people mm. may interpret it in that way, right? I see. Yeah. For the first question, I mean, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, in Iran too, there are all kinds of possession practices. I mean, there's the czar cults, yeah. uh, so-called, in the south, which are similar yeah. and, and have a, um, I mean, they're materially connected and historically connected to czar possession in, in the Sudan. Um, and then there are others like uh, what's called Porhani in, uh, among Turkmen uh, in the Northeast. Um, as far as I know, uh, I mean, I haven't studied uh, Porhani or czar uh, possession other than watching videos of them. Um, as far as I know, though, uh, Hollywood cinema uh, isn't part of the repertoire, right, of the way they talk about that. What I found striking when I was uh, when I participated in cosmic mysticism was that there actually I could see ways in which the possession the possession um, the forms in which some of the possessions took were actually quite similar to Hollywood film, right? Um, in a way that differed from either Porhani or or Zar, right? And that's one of the things that initially got me interested was to think about how. It wasn't just they who noticed the similarity. I, as an outsider, was also seeing a similarity, right? Now, we could go after a kind of a causal explanation. Why is it that this is similar, right? Is it because they're watching films? Is it because the films are actually somehow influenced by these kinds of possessions? Or, you know, there, you, could, you could look for all kinds of chains of association. Or is there something else going on, right? So I was, I was interested in kind of going beyond merely a causal sort of interpretation. Thank you. So I have a question that has two parts that are interrelated and yet not. Uh, so one is the question um, as to whether any of your interlocutors had any comments about Iranian film mm -hmm. um, rather than something from the outside. And the second one relating to that was the question of whether the, the fact of dubbing or, um, or uh, kind of a secondary language, so is the displacement of language, is that doing something that kind of allows that makes it cosmopolitan as the that which is separate but also together, mm -hmm. uh, and whether that's why Iranian films wouldn't do this or not or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, on the first question, yes and no. So the yes is about uh, people, authors, and film critics who've written about spiritual cinema, right? They. Uh, often do comparisons. Not necessarily between horror cinema and, say, Majid Majidi, right? But um, between uh, Ingmar Bergman and, uh, I don't know, Razami Academy or something, right? It's, it's about, you know, the, the, there's films that they find commensurable in some way, right? But definitely uh, a lot of the kind of intellectual exertion around spiritual cinema had to do with slotting films, like seeing which films actually fit in this and which didn't, right? Um, there was another side to this, which was that uh, as more and more uh, horror, supernatural, sci-fi uh, films were broadcast within Iran itself, there were also uh, attempts to create Iranian films that in some way approached um, stylistically, technologically, thematically, right, those kinds of representations. So. The most the the um, big budget example uh, was a film about uh, Solomon, that uh, was made by I forget who the who the director was, but it was um, is made about I think uh, five or six years ago. Uh, it didn't succeed, but it was um, you know it was an attempt. I didn't hear anybody saying I watched Solomon and the, you know the the representations of jinn were accurate, right? But they but the producers. And the critics definitely saw this as a kind of an experiment in, um, in spiritual cinema.
Um, and uh, famously, also around the same time, there were a lot of TV series, broadcast during Ramadan in particular, where there was some kind of supernatural component. So um, there was one TV series, for example, about a, a guy who gets knocked out. He's, he's, he's in a coma, and then his soul starts to venture around, and he kind of gets embroiled in a murder. I mean, in, in the case of es essentially his own disappearance. So there was a lot, of, a lot of very direct references to the film Ghost, right, in that film, um, both in terms of the way the ghost actually acts in the world, his ability to move through things, and so on, um, uh, but also kind of in terms of narrative structure. Um, but what was different about it was that it was, uh, compared to Ghost, was that there was a very explicit attempt to make this not just a piece of entertainment, but actually something that taught people something about spiritual matters, right? And these, are, these were controversial. I mean, there were always, after each of these sessions, there would be a discussion. There, was, there would be a round table on TV where people would be discussing, so, you know, how do we think about this? How do we think about this episode? And so on. Even, even representations, right? Is, it, is this an accurate representation of what souls actually do in the world, right? Um, what was one thing that I found really interesting was that after a certain point, these TV series began uh, hiring, at least on paper, religious experts uh, to show that they had done their homework in their representation, which didn't necessarily dissuade the critics. I mean, the critics would often, eh, this, this, none of this really makes any sense, but, you know, but whatever. Um, on the second question, it's really interesting, and I don't know. Um, the dubbing question, I mean, some of these films, most of the films that I was talking about have been dubbed and they're watched in their dubbed form, but people also seek out the originals and sometimes they will watch the originals, right? Um, uh, whether their compellingness kind of has to do with the doubleness of the language, I mean, that's something really interesting to think about. Yeah. More questions? Thank you very, very much. Thank you.